Okay, so good afternoon. Today I can announce the date for the by-election in Northland uh, will be Saturday the 28th of March. I made this decision after considering advice from the Electoral Commission over the weekend and this morning. Uh, this timing, I believe, gives parties adequate time to prepare while allowing the process to move forward as it needs to. The by-election RIP day uh, will be Monday the 23rd of February and the deadline for candidates' nominations to be received will be noon on Tuesday the 3rd of March. Uh, the last day for the return of the RIP will be Tuesday uh, the 14th of April. Uh, I'm looking forward to travelling to Waitangi this week. As I do every year, this year we commemorate 175 years of the treaty relationship. That's a relationship we should all have pride in. Over the last six years, a great deal has been achieved through the Crown and iwi working together. Um, and the relationship we have with the Māori Party has contributed hugely to that. Uh, they brought a rich dimension to this government. I'm particularly proud of our record on treaty settlements. We've signed 46 deeds of settlement with iwi in the last six years. By way of comparison, the previous government signed 16 settlements uh, in nine years. These settlements have allowed significant economic development, not just for iwi, but for the regions in which they are based. So this Thursday morning, I will attend the Pofuri and Hui, which uh, follows as always, and then I'll meet with iwi leaders and later attend a uh, beat the retreat ceremony. Um, on Friday, I'll be at the dawn service uh, in the Treaty House, and later in the morning, I'll speak at my annual breakfast uh, event. Uh, this week, the British Foreign Secretary, the Right Honourable Philip Hammond, will be visiting New Zealand. Uh, Foreign uh, Minister Murray McCulley and I will be meeting with Mr Hammond uh, during what is uh, his first visit to New Zealand and the region as Foreign Secretary. This will provide a useful opportunity to discuss mutual foreign policy priorities, including our role in the Security Council. We're also grateful for Mr Hammond as he's agreed to address our One Day Caucus. It's a chance to hear his perspective on the upcoming British election and also more broadly on international affairs. You will of course recall that I spoke at the Conservative Party Away Day uh, in 2013. Uh, lastly, in terms of my activities this week, tomorrow the National Party All Day Caucus will be held at Premier House, as is the tradition, I'm sure I'll see a few of you there in the morning on my arrival, and on Wednesday I'll be travelling to the Waikato uh, for a number of events, as I mentioned, and I'll be at Waitangi Thursday and Friday. Unlike Saban, did you know before the election that there were allegations about a police investigation into him? No, um, I can't speak about police investigations because I can speak about those matters. But uh, in terms of Mr. Saban, uh, I was aware of the personal and family interest, or made aware. Uh, there's no written record, but it looks like, uh, according to my office, it's very, very early December. It's in, it's in that sort of period of a week or week and a half prior to the uh, breakup of Parliament. That's the first time you've been anything. Was that before or after you appointed him as Secretary That would be well truly after. What about your office? Was your office aware? Not before, no. What about anyone in the National Party? Were you aware of the allegations about police investigation? Not according to the President. I've asked him. He wasn't aware, no. Is he under the President? Is he correct that National, that were the candidacy in Canterbury and Northland, that National Party were aware of the no, I don't think that's right. I mean, we haven't. One of the reasons why the by election is set for the 28th of March is because we're going to open nominations and it's going to take us a good, good sort of four week period. We can't close nominations before about the 28th of uh, February. Uh, and that's because we want to make sure we pick a good candidate and get a good person for a seat that we're obviously very keen to retain. So, no, that's not true. Very early December, was that, um, is that when you found out? What am I saying? I can't ask you. I had a really good question line you, but I can do my best. Oh, sorry. Is that when you found out um, about that there was a police investigation, or was that when you heard rumours? No, I, well, I'm not going to go into the information I was told. I was simply told that the personal and family matter that ultimately Mr. Saban is pursuing, I was told in very early, very early December. Did you consider standing him down as a slip chair at that time? No, I didn't. Um, look, at the end of the day, uh, the reason I didn't was because you know, I thought on balance, given the information I had at that time, uh, the you know, course of action I took, which was to let things ride and see how they progressed, this is about the right course of action. If it was a minister, probably would have taken a step to step someone down, but as a select committee chair, I, I don't think so, no. Do you, Do you think you've handled this up until now? No, I'm, you, you'll appreciate the situation we're in. I think I've handled it uh, as you would expect me to within the law. Have you started your replacement on the select committee yet? 
No, but Jerry Brown needs to, need to consider that matter. So you, you knew there were police investigations on the way? No, I'm not going into what I knew. But you were still happy for him to be the, the chair of that committee? With the information that I had, I was very happy with the position I took. Do you know if any of your ministers were aware earlier? The I'm not aware of that, no. When did, you first, when did you first, if you talk about seeking, mm -hmm. taking legal advice on this, yep. when did you get that? Or when did you ask him there was some, obviously I was aware that there would be uh, questions raised because there had been some stories in the newspaper. So when I got back from Davos, I just obviously checked you know, what my position was and what I was able to say and wasn't able to say. So that's this year? Oh, that's this year. You, you were aware of this matter, but you still thought it was appropriate to this chair. It's not just any sneak committee, it's the law and order sneak committee. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. On the information I knew, yeah. Andrew Little says he had heard rumours about this bar before December. How does he find out about them and not you? Wouldn't have a clue, but all I can tell you is that's what I know. Would you expect your MPs to come forward straight away with information like this? Uh, it depends on the individual MP and on the circumstances and on what they think they're doing. I mean, in the perfect world we live in a, in a world of kind of no surprises and they tell us as early as they can if they've got a particular family matter. Some are a little better than others in, in telling us up front straight away. Have you ever given them the message and told them that's what they should be doing? Yeah, we regularly do that, but people treat things in different ways. How do you, you don't know if any ministers were told oh, under the no surprises? Sorry? You don't know if any ministers were told of under the no surprises policy? I'm not aware of any, no. Last week you said you spoke to him last year. When was that? What was that? I have absolutely no idea when it was. It was certainly, <coughs> I'd have to, like, there would be no record of that. It would be sometime when he was in caucus or something, but not this matter. I've never spoken to him about this matter. Have you spoken to him since he resigned? No, I haven't. Should local government government ministers have a no surprises expectation <coughs> in public service? Do party leaders and prime ministers expect the same courtesy from their, from their MPs? Uh, one more time, so I didn't hear the question. If you have a no surprises policy that applies to the public sector and chief executives, yeah. does a prime minister and a party leader have that same expectation of his MPs? Yep, that's our preference that people come and tell us, and I will say to caucus, you know, if there's a particular issue you're dealing with them, and look, there's 60 people in our caucus. Uh, people face all sorts of family issues, health issues, you know, all sorts of different issues that they that they consider, uh, and we always encourage them to try and come talk to us. But people treat things in different circumstances in different ways. It depends on you know, a whole variety of different reasons. When you were made aware, this? when you were made aware, was it by Mr. Saban or was it by? A no, it was my chief of staff, Tom. My chief of staff. They had Mr. Saban told him, or was it then? Uh, I. I don't know the exact details there. On local councils, would you, your government be prepared to let councils impose uh, income taxes and increase GST in the regions? Uh, I think we'd be very reluctant. I mean, the whole issue of, of uh, funding councils and whether they you know, could look to alternative funding streams is <coughs> something that's been raised you know, time and again. It's not a new issue, and our local government have put out a paper on that. Uh, and we're happy to have discussions with them, but as a general rule, we're very cognizant of putting more cost. Uh, on taxpayers and ratepayers who are inevitably one and the same thing more often than not. And so, look, we ha we'll have discussions with them. Uh, no one's argued that rates is a perfect system, and there are examples in local communities where there's a big influx of cost of people, for instance, on tourism uh, perspectives, uh, and not necessarily the rate base to pay for that. We're, we're aware of that. You saw us allow our levy, for instance, to be applied in Stewart Island, but uh, as a general rule, massive increases of costs on ratepayers is not something we're looking towards. Councils argue though that they, there's a, a huge funding shortfall and that they won't be able to fund the infrastructure required over the next 10 or 20 years. Yeah, but I would sort of say if you look at it, you know, they've been funding that infrastructure, this is not a new issue for a very long period of time. Uh, they don't, as a general rule, seem to have excessive levels of debt. Uh, they have a range of different assets that they own. Uh, there are specific examples like Christchurch, where we're working with the Christchurch Council, but that's a result of the Christchurch earthquakes. Um, as a general rule, you know, it's an issue that's raised from time to time. In, as I say, in certain communities, Queenstown's a good example where this issue's raised. Uh, you do see it as an issue sometimes tied to something like a convention centre, but across the board, wholesale restructuring or reform of the way local government is funded is not something we have on the agenda at this time. They say that um changing structure of the population, ageing population, <coughs> less willingness or ability to handle rates means they'll have to change their structure. What do you think about that argument? 
Uh, I'm not sure the age in the population ultimately alters that much. I mean, councils have for a long time now been deploying a, you know, the capacity for people, for instance, to uh, fund their rates bill, if you like, out of their, um, their assets so that ultimately can be paid for by their estate and the likes if they're cash strapped. I mean, I think the, the, the main point I would sort of make is that you know, rates, rates are an impost on, on obviously rate payers. Uh, we just got to be cautious about how much impost we put on on ratepayers because in the end, you know, there's a lot of costs coming at them, and we want to make sure that um, money isn't being wasted. So, I don't think anyone's ever argued rates is the perfect system, uh, but one concern we would have is if we open the floodgates to a whole range of other taxes and ways of, of uh, funding local government, then the cost could dramatically go up. The services wouldn't necessarily actually improve, and you could see you know, consumers paying a lot more. So we're just very conscious of that issue. Prime Minister, did the uh, Kiva discuss today um, sending uh, non-combat trained uh, soldiers to uh, Iraq to help fight the Islamic State? No, there's no discussion on Iraq today. When do you think that that decision, that, that final decision will be made? Uh, it's, there's a, it's contingent on a number of factors. So we need the defence people to come back and give us a uh, pricey of what they've learnt in terms of the recce that's taking place um, in Iraq. Um, we haven't got that information yet. There's been some discussions happening with the Iraqi government uh, and their perspective on, on training people. Uh, so we're working our way through it. So it certainly wasn't there this week. I, I doubt it would be next week. It, you'd expect us to get on with it, but I mean, in terms of making a decision and getting a paper, but uh, so more by the end of, of February, but it certainly wasn't this week. Will you raise that matter with Philip Hammond? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll have a discussion with him about ISIS and the response to that. I mean, I had uh, a brief discussion with David Cameron about the broader issue, and uh, you know, obviously everyone can see what's happened, uh, you know, the North tragedy that uh, has occurred to Japan over the weekend. Who has um, been speaking with the Iraqi government here, our foreign affairs staff? Yeah, I think it's at the MFAT level, um, but there's, you know, there's, it's quite clear that the foreign minister, Murray McCulley, will have some discussions over the next few weeks. So will he, will he go to Iraq like what um, uh, Julie Bishop did? It's, that's a possibility, and it's also possible that um, some Iraqi officials may come and visit New Zealand. That's also a possibility. That's so so our, our, our officials in, have our officials been to Iraq to talk to them or those no, I don't think so. I mean, we have representation in the region. Um, there's been obviously people as part of the contingent that's been doing the, re the recce work for defence. So, so Iraqi visitors, would they be, you know, politicos or politicos. military? Possible politicos. Is it taking a lot longer than you'd hope? Yeah, I mean, it's a complicated process mm -hmm. because obviously we want to do the right thing um, for the people of Iraq. Secondly, we want to make sure that they're welcomed and they can operate under the normal uh, terms that we would expect. Thirdly, we've got to make sure it's as safe as it can be and what's a dangerous environment. So these things are never that straightforward. There are a lot of countries getting involved in training. I think in the latest numbers I saw, there's around about 23 countries making a contribution of some sort. So there are, it's not like New Zealand's in isolation, but we are treating cautiously when it comes to this issue. You mean 23 military, not, I thought there were 60. There were yeah, the but in terms of training, I think there's oh, 23. I what can we offer in terms of military training the 10 years of American intervention in Iraq uh, Well, I th I, look, I think there, there are different times and different situations. I mean, I've seen those arguments around the enormous amount of money that was spent training um, Iraqi forces and it wasn't terribly successful. I think when it became a lot more successful was when the Iraqi government actually wanted that and when they had a much more inclusive approach was that that's what really led to the awakenings. And I think ultimately um, this is the issue is that in the end, I, as I've said so often before, I think the solution in Iraq and the solution to standing up to ISIS ultimately comes when the people of Iraq believe there's an inclusive government. But as part of that government, they need to better have some resources. And my understanding is the Iraqi government would support the training of some of their people to give them those resources. Well, one of the things you consider is yeah. one of the things you're considering the ability to uh, fly the personnel in and out without using ropes. Totally. I mean, that's Why? one of the conditions. Well, because there's always a risk in those sorts of environments of IED bombs. And the more time people spend on the ground outside of a secure facility, the riskier it is.
So one of the conditions we've been looking at is fly in fly out capability. And what's wrong with that? Oh, it's, there's a range of different options that have been um, suggested as I understand it. And part of it's been looking at the various options and seeing where we think you know, potentially the best location would be. Um, as I said, if we do this, we're likely to probably do it alongside Australia. They're also looking at some of the issues there. And we're just taking a pretty cautious approach to making sure if we make this call, we're making the right call. Would we use our own equipment for that, for Australia? Uh, I don't honestly have the answer to that. I imagine we'd probably a mixture of both. When did you take the South first one? When did you take the South first one down about any issues with Wednesday? I don't have that data, though. Or was it much earlier than when you found out today? I don't think so, but I need to check to be sure. Just going back to Iraq for a moment. Um, given the extra demands on MFAT um, over Iraq and the proactive role that Mr. McClay is taking in New York over yep. the Security Council in Ukraine and Haiti, have you given any thought to extra resourcing or funding for MFAT to cope with this added work? Uh, for the Security Council? I think, in the, I think in the mission uh, in New York there is a little extra resource. You need to ask Mr McCulley, but I'm pretty sure that they are putting in extra resource and extra support there. And certainly, you know, one of the things I was conscious of when we did the Cabinet line-up uh, last year, one of the reasons why you know, I thought it would make sense for Mr McCulley not to be the Sport Minister, um, he's obviously a social, but not to be sport. One, because I wanted to tie it with health and have Jonathan Coleman there. But second thing was just I was conscious of how busy he would be. And you can see that. I mean, Mr mccully has been in Addis um, at the African Union last week. I mean, that's probably not something we would have gone to, but we went because of our role in the Security Council. So there are just greater um, you know, demands on Because anecdotally, time. we're hearing that the resources are very stretched down there at the moment. I haven't had any reports on that, but you'd need to ask um, from Mr's office. Something like Saban again, sorry. Yeah. Um, can you guarantee that Wayne Anderson didn't know before the election? Yes, he didn't know before the election, I don't know the exact date of when he knew, but it was around about when I knew. Um, it might have been slightly earlier, obviously, because he told me, but yeah, as I say, I knew very early December. I didn't know any time prior to that, didn't have any inkling prior to that. To be frank, I hate to say it because Mr Saban won't like this, he was on the list of, of um, likely to be a minister. It was a real toss-up between him and a couple of other people that, that got in. That's how confident we were, uh, or how lacking in knowledge of other issues that we were. So it came as quite a shock to me when I was told of the family matters he's pursuing. But let's see how that goes. And you've got no idea how the staff found out? No, you'd need to ask my office and I'll give you that information. What portfolios were you looking at giving him? Oh, I'm not going to that. Do you well, really um, think it's appropriate for Philip Hammond to be addressing a political caucus? We thought, I mean, you, might, we thought you might ask that question, actually. Um, yeah, we do. Um, so, so basically, our view is that, look, he's coming to New Zealand, he's meeting the leader of the opposition, he's obviously leading, meeting in my capacity as Prime Minister, and they're separate meetings. But I, I think it's fine, actually, for him to come and... He's, he's really going to give our caucus an update on what's happening in the British election and his perspective on what's happening in international events. It's not, it's not that unusual. I mean, you had a situation where you know, the Labour Party caucus, uh, a Labour Party conference last year, just before the election, Bill Shorten went over and spoke yeah, to But him. he wasn't representing Australia. I mean, how would you feel if John Kerry turned up at the Labour Party caucus in Martinborough? I feel surprised <laughs> and a little disappointed for him. I'd tell him to come down to the real party, but you know, in the end, if he wanted to, I'd be okay with it. Oh, no, true. He wants to hang out in Martinborough with the Labour Party cook, isn't it? Since you were spending your February. On the trade access, um, yep. Fonterra Trade access. Trade access. Yep. Uh, Fonterra let its um, cheese export licences to the United States lapse. How do you feel about that? I don't have any details on that, I'm sorry. Sorry, tomorrow's caucus, is yep. there a particular focus for the meeting? Well, it's obviously scoping out the year ahead. Um, there's, a, there's a range of different issues. I mean, everything from uh, essentially what our goals and ambitions are for this year, where the big work program is, some of the things that uh, the policy that we're working on, sense of the caucus to give some feedback. So it's, it's, standard, it's a sort of stock standard you know, yearly sort of meeting. Uh, but, yeah, look, the caucus is in good heart. I suspect they've had a very good summer. I think you can see from the polls that have come out, you know, the government's travelling well. Uh, but we're conscious as anybody that, you know, it's a big, long, hard road in, here in front of us and we've got to have to work every single day to earn the right to continue to be the government. What Given sort of reception are you expecting at Waitangi this week? I think a bit rough. I mean, like, I wish I could tell you it would be, you know, uh, kind of peaches and cream, but my experience of being up there in the last, you know, I think this will be my ninth time, 
is that the, you know, there's always a mixture of different things that happen, but down on TT Marae, it's, it's normally a pretty robust sort of environment. Um, What's particularly changed this year? I don't think it's... I don't think that reaction would be different to you know, previous years, really. I mean, if you think it through, I've had everything from you know, someone taking a swing at me outside the treaty grounds right through to being shouted off on TT Marae to being held up for hours of going in there to, you know, basically hickories where people will make them offers to come to Wellington to learn more about it, not turning up. There's always a range of different things that happen there. But on the other side of the coin, I also think that we get an opportunity to put out our case and some people will hear that. I think we get some marks for constantly turning up year after year. We have good engagement with our local iwi up there and we're progressing in the settlement. Uh, we're trying to. Uh, we have good engagement with iwi leaders and we've got a lot we want to talk to them about everything from water to whanau ora. Uh, so, you know, I'm never going to shy away because it'll be robust down on Titi Marae. Are you worried about your safety? No, I don't worry about it. Where's the Ngāpuhi settlement process at? Well, it's... it's you know, they've got a they've got a mandate um, or mandated committee, and they're um, they're moving along. So the the, discussions um, with, with Sunny Tone. You're the TV3 poll. How formidable opponent do you see Andrew Littlewood? Um, well, I take every leader of the opposition seriously, you know, for very very good reason. And so, you know, in, the, in a way, I mean, the, the poll I thought was probably quite good for, for Labour and National. Actually, I mean, it's a very good result from our point of view. I mean, we're polling 50 percent. Uh, those numbers are strong. Uh, what's clear is that they, you know, Labour are cannibalising a bit of like vote on the <coughs> left and uh, that's sort of the natural reaction that you typically get in the honeymoon period but you know, bluntly this still at 29 odd percent. Uh, Helen Clark won elections at 40. On the Iraq decision, is there any um, question that the Credit World Cup is delaying the decision? No. On, on, the, on, on, on the Iraq decision? Yeah. No, no. Uh, in the Cricket World Cup, or, or everything I hear is it's progressing well and people are comfortable with what's going on. Now, the, the issue with Iraq is just simply, you know, we have to finalise group that we're going to do it in terms of training. It's ensuring that we have the facility that we're comfortable with. It's the makeup of what's there. It's all of those logistic issues are not as straightforward as you might think. How quickly will it progress once some of those things happen? <clears throat> well, I don't have any advice on that, but one would assume if they got to the point where we could agree a location and we were ready to go and on the basis that we're working with Australia, it's some months after that, but not six months. You know, Given the ISIS threat against Japan for the last couple of yep. days, does that make <coughs> becoming involved a more difficult decision for your government? No, I think it's a <coughs> standard practice for a sort of terrorist group like ISIS to try and intimidate countries. But the counter-argument is that if you buy into that intimidation, that just allows them to become stronger and ultimately <coughs> to take uh, even more... Uh, Actions against your your nationals. I don't I don't buy the argument. Somehow it says that if you if you don't somehow get involved at all, you'll be perfectly safe from that. There's no evidence to support that. Um, and I think ISIS is, is something that we have to confront. I mean, they are a brutal um, organisation. Uh, and you know, we can sit around and debate it all we like, but this is an organisation that has used children to behead people. They've thrown gay people off off. Um, you know, building structures, they're out there murdering people. I mean, we're really saying New Zealand, this country that we argue, stands up for what's right and fair, is going to be one of the few countries in the developed world that's going to do absolutely nothing. I don't think most New Zealanders would support that view. I accept that there's some danger, and I accept that uh, it's not an easy decision. But last time I looked, New Zealand's known as a country that stands up for what's right. And there, there are dozens and dozens of countries that are going to play a role or are preparing to play a role. Now, you know, I think New Zealand's got to make its, the correct choices in terms of what we do, but I don't think doing nothing is an option. It's got to be something. The question is what something looks like. What, what, would, your the position, um, what would your position be then, Prime Minister, if New Zealand was kidnapped by ISIS as part of the plan deployment? Well, we, New Zealand doesn't pay ransom. It's been our long-standing position. And if you do, then you put at risk other other New Zealanders. Given that the um, Kurdish Peshmerga seem to be the effective fighting force against yeah. ISIS, has there been any thought of um, sending our training uh, forces to support them <coughs> rather than the, the Iraqi army? Um, there hasn't been. There's been you know loose discussion about you know about that given the overall situation there, and that's certainly where the Brits, for instance, are training people. I think it's the Kurds yeah. mostly. Um, 
they have reasons for you know you know kind of for that. There's obvious reasons for that. I mean, yes, of course that's a possibility, but um, you know at the margins, I'm I'm still reasonably comfortable with what we proposing or at least considering is, is a, a good option. I mean, there might be an argument slightly safer if you were training them out of country, you know, somewhere else, but it's at the margins, I think. Prime Minister, there's a handful of councillors that are slowing up these great cycleways uh, in Wellington. Is there any way you can get somebody in your office to bang a few heads together? <laughs> Well, we can always get someone in my office to bang heads together. Um, I hope they don't. I mean, the, the whole purpose of us putting in, for instance, the money that we were putting in, in terms of urban cycleways is a, a reflection of the amount of demand that's there, the interest that, that not just Wellingtonians but people around the country have, and actually the need for a much safer, I think, cycling environment. And if you look at, um, you know, basically from the Patani foreshore into the CBD here in Wellington, for instance, I mean, what a magnificent cycleway that could be, and how safe that could be, and fundamentally, uh, how dangerous it currently is when you see cyclists, you know, half time cycling on, on the motorway there. And I, I think we've got the capacity with government resources and working with the council uh, to complete some of those cycleways in a reasonable time frame. So I, I don't know all the ins and outs of why the councils are, or the council is, is slow at the moment on these particular issues, but given the mayor is a mad keen advocate of cycling and the government's got resources there, hopefully we can sort it out. Okay.